We would love to talk to you about your salvation. Uh, as a reminder, for all regulars at Hope, on the bookshelf out there, anything is free if you're giving it to a, an unbeliever. Please be aware of that. You can cover that cost if you like. We would like that to happen, but it's free if it's going to an unbeliever for the sake of their soul. Um, if you can't afford something, just ask somebody. You'll get it pretty cheap. Uh, but also, if, if you're a regular here and you have a, a non-believing friend with you or you want to uh, uh, be uh, uh, instrumental in their coming to Jesus Christ, we usually have a book out there called By Grace Alone, basically a soul-winning gospel preaching book. Uh, at the moment, I think we're out of stock. We have the older version, All of Grace, out there. Please grab one and give them to anybody in our midst who is interested in finding out more about the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So let's read First Peter chapter 1, verse 8, uh, verse uh, 14 and onwards is what we will uh, read tonight. Verse 14 says, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. And if you call on him as father, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, then conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. Knowing this, that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers. Isn't that amazing? Do not fear because you're not sure if you're ransomed. Don't fear because hell still hangs over you. Don't fear as if you were condemned still. Fear because you've been ransomed. Fear God because he's your father. This is a, this is a piety, John Calvin would say, a, a holiness, a devotion in heart, a, a fear from straying from him because he is so good. He's my father. I've been ransomed unto him and by him. Conduct yourself with fear in the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. May God bless this word in our midst. If you want that, say amen. amen. We need God's spirit to give our souls the blessing that the word of God holds out and offers us. We need his spirit to apply to our hearts through our minds what the word of God really means. And tonight we're sort of encased in this exhortation to holiness. That is the Apostle Peter as a pastor and a soul winner and a preacher would say to those who he believes were ransomed. They have faith in Christ. They've been baptized. They're church members. He says, you are Christians, yet still conduct yourself with fear. Live a life that shows to me by apparent tangible metrics. You really believe that you are purchased away from your futile, silly, worthless, damnable tradition. Some of you have come from paganism or heathen cultures. Some of you have just come from the now heathen culture called the West and individualism. Some of you have come from horrible backgrounds. Some of you from kind of Christian backgrounds. Yet all of us have inherited sin as our nature. All of us have followed according to the courses of this world, at least in our heart. And it is by the grace of God that he ransomed us away from that. And Peter says, it should look like it. For you were purchased. Here's his motivating power. Here's the leveraging motivation that Peter says should convince you, should motivate you, should inspire and spur you on to holiness. The thing which purchased you away from your paganism, your forefathers' religion and traditions and your, your, your sinfulness was nothing short of the precious blood of Christ. Not all the gold in the world was heaped up into a sum. Not all of the riches of every angel, not every title from every king and ruler. Nothing could purchase us and nothing did purchase us. So it doesn't matter what could or would anyway. What did purchase us was the blood of Jesus Christ. And this is our consideration tonight. Let's first think about the cost that was paid for in the blood of Jesus Christ. As Peter says, we were bought, we were purchased, we now belong to Jesus by a transaction that has occurred. What was that price that was paid? It was the price, not so much as we said of the, as we've said in previous weeks, and I will remind us, it is not so much the inherent value of the material called Christ's 
hemoglobin. It was not the liquid of Christ's blood so that if he stubbed his toe, hit his thumb with the hammer or knocked his head in the workshop growing up, that that blood fallen to the ground would have affected any salvation or, or soul winning. Not at all. The fact that Christ's blood purchased us is because his blood was poured out, Isaiah 53 prophesies. It was poured out into death. Because the God become man, God man, Messiah Jesus Christ, entered into the the depth of the grave of death. Because he went into death and its doors and its, its mouth shut behind him, only because he bled to the point of death, Can we now say that the life of the God-man has been given in purchase of sinners? So what is the price that the blood of Jesus exacted or transferred? It was the life value of the infinite God come perfect man, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Who was it paid to though? It's an interesting question. You ask different guys throughout different eras of church history or different people in different traditions today, and you'll get different, some weird, some downright heretical, meaning outside of the Christian faith, not consistent or congruent with true doctrine uh, kind of ideas. One of those ideas has been, well, of course, we've all seen the Great Ransom movie. I don't know who you are or where you are, but I have a particular set of skills to find men like this. I will find you and I will kill you. Anybody watch the Apostle Liam Neeson's movies religiously? Great, good on you. Uh, We've all seen a great ransom kidnapping movie. And of course, it is the terrorists, it is the uh, uh, man stealers, it is the kidnappers who leave behind the ransom note require a ransom price and receive the ransom, unless you stole Liam Neeson's kid, then you get shot in France. Uh, But if uh, anywhere else, uh, if if it wasn't Liam Neeson's kids, you get paid a ransom price. You own the captive, you get the price. And therefore, the half a million dollars or the $40 million is transferred into your account, which affects the liberation of the uh, kidnappee who then goes home, everybody's happy, and the price has been paid. Is that how we should think of the gospel of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? It, it, should we think of, uh, you know, some men will say, well, this it simply transfers pretty simply over to the great, uh, great cinematic uh, uh, unfolding of history that we call the gospel. You see, Satan had gone into that uh, first garden with our first mother and father, Adam and Eve, and he tricked them, and he, he subdued them, and he, he tempted them, and they sinned, and then he got the keys. God gave him the keys of rule and reign, and therefore he was triumphant. He was victor. He was ruler uh, over this present darkness. And you can, you can already sort of sound hear some elements of truth in that. Does not the Bible say that he reigns in this present world, that he's the ruler of this age? Well, yes. What they posit, however, is that Satan, by his ownership of sinners, has such a sovereignty that stops God from his liberating desires. In other words, Satan and God become almost equals in the divine law court. That God would want us saved, God would want us to heaven. God would would want us forgiven and brought back. But Satan, pesky old Satan, he said no. He puts out a ransom price. He demands of God the blood of his son. And so God, in acquiescence to Satan's will, in obeisance to Satan's desires, in satisfaction of Satan's standards, sends his son who goes into the earth, who dies a terrible death. Satan collects all the blood, the sufferings, the gore, and the horrors of the death of Jesus Christ. And he willingly, as would any devil, willingly lets go of the pesky human souls he had captive because now he has the value, the death, the sufferings of Jesus Christ, God's own son. He goes skipping and dancing to the bank and cashes it out as the victor. You tell me that's the gospel. I say to you, you're worshipping Satan because he's the one who wins at the cross. Satan is not primarily the one who has captivity over us. It is rather God. We are under God's wrath, therefore apportioned a curse. We are under the curse of God. A part of God's curse for us An element of our cursedness and our punishment is that he allows the devil infinite rings of authority beneath him 
to play upon us, to destroy us, to curse us, and to harm us. This is the human uh, situation, this side of the fall into sin from Adam and Eve. This is false religions. This is darkness and ignorance and child sacrifice and human sacrifice and and man-made religions and cults. This is what that is. This is the devil and his demons running amok among the human race as if we needed help to sin anyway. And they are, in a sense, utilizing our slavery under God's just law. They are given legal right at that point to harm us, to, 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 to throw their, their own sort of glory, their pathetic little devilish schemes upon us. Is there a sense in which outside of Jesus Christ, humankind are under the tyranny of Satan? Yes. But is it such a tyranny that Satan himself is ultimately sovereign over? No. No, as At any moment that God wished to withdraw the devil's grasp upon this world, he would do it in an instant, but we would still remain under God's curse. The one to whom Jesus' blood, Jesus' life, Jesus' death, Jesus' cross was a payment was not to the devil. He had no infinite just standards or desires or bank account or ransom that needed to be paid. Rather, the the price that needed to be covered was our legal debt unto God. Once that was paid, we would be liberated from God's prison where the devil is running amok, do you see? The devil is just as much a prisoner under God's curse as we were outside of Jesus. Once justice has been paid for us, and it is justice that is paid, it is God's law that is paid, it is the Father whose standards are paid, it is the triune God whose infinite requirements are paid by Jesus' death, then we are liberated and we are no longer owned, condemned, held fast by the law which condemns us. The shackles are broken off and we leave the devil in that cell, that jail called condemnation, which is the only place he gets to make accusations and slanders against those who are under the law. We are not ransomed from Satan. Jesus was not paying a ransom to Satan. The ransom was made to God's justice. This is no bribery. It's not as if God justly required all of our souls in hell forever to pay for our sins, but instead, Jesus, like a great sort of small-town cop or, 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 or or, you know, a, a, a pesky lawyer sort of strikes a deal, throws a bribery under the table, and the judge says, this will do. That's fine. I'll, I'll take this over uh, billions of souls in hell any day. It is not bribery. It was not being paid off. It is the just requirements of God paid in full. It was that our moral debt, our sins in value, our devalue, our crimes, our fines, if you would like to use that analogy, our fines that had racked up such an infinitely high degree of debt before God, that debt was paid in the blood and the death of Jesus. Therefore, we can say, because Jesus fulfilled justice, therefore, he has purchased our souls back from slavery, imprisonment, the devil, tyranny, and the curse. That is the glory of Jesus' death in our place. We must therefore exult in this cost. Before we sort of look at applications or what Peter says, how holiness should flow out of a heart, embracing this reality of being purchased by Jesus, we must exult that such a price, the blood of Jesus, so precious and incomparable, invaluable and inestimable, was paid for you. We must exult in triumph, in jubilation and elation. For that we will be doing forever and ever and ever and ever in heaven, according to Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5, verse 9 and 10, speaks of the angels, the elders, the creatures, the souls of the ransomed, all in heaven. In your Revelation chapter 5, verse 9 and 10, they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you. If you can picture the scene, the elders, the, tr- the, the, the angels, the, uh, the, the, the ransomed souls, the, the, the magical, mystical creatures that surround God's throne, they are singing to what is called the lion. That's a pretty powerful, strong animal to depict God's Savior, the Lion of Judah, Jesus Christ. He is called the lion, but when John looks at him in the Revelation, he sees a huge, white, bloodied lamb. A pure white fleece lamb with a crown upon its head that is soaked in blood, that is dripping in blood. 
that is is sort of uh, mingled throughout the fleece and dripping on the floor and on the throne. This is the lion, the slain lamb, and this is why they sing. Because they say the Savior, the lion, has saved by his dying as a lamb. So they sing a new song saying, worthy are you to the lamb to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain. This is why Jesus has the authority to walk up to God, to take the, the scroll, which is, which is the accounting of all human history. That is the, the chronicles of the King Jesus Christ. He has the ability, the power, the authority to crack open those seals and unravel the role of history under his new reign and kingdom because all authority was given to him because he was slain. For you were slain, say all those souls in heaven. You were slain, and by your blood, you ransomed people for God. From every tribe and language, and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Our hearts should be enlarged to think upon this thing. That when God, through his son, through the angels, spoke to John and gave him a revelation that was supposed to be the most encouraging vision that he could ever receive as an apostle in exile being persecuted, over a church being persecuted by religious enemies, political enemies, enemies with the, the sword of the tongue and slander, enemies of the sword of the, of the, of, of the metal to kill and slay, What could God give to this suffering, dying old apostle to maximally rejoice, to maximally encourage him? It is a picture of Jesus' blood in heaven being sung for it is the emblem of purchase of every soul that will be in heaven. Isaac Ambrose was a Puritan and he wrote this about the blood of Jesus. He says, be enlarged, O my soul. Sound forth the praises of thy Christ. Tell all the world that the warmest love of Christ, which flowed with his blood out of all of his wounds, in, uh, out of all of his wounds into thy spirit. Tune thy strings, O soul, aright, and keep consort with all the angels of heaven and all the saints on earth. Sing that psalm of John the Apostle. Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his blood and has made us kings and priests unto God. And to his father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. And the saints said, Isaac Ambrose says, be enlarged my heart and tune yourself to the strings of heaven. Sing the glories of Jesus whose precious blood purchased you. A very reasonable, necessary implication or application of of knowing, of the knowledge, of reminding ourselves that we are purchased by nothing else other than the pure, wonderful, precious blood of Jesus, my friends, is that you must take comfort. In Acts chapter 20, verse 28. In Acts chapter 20, verse 28, Paul told the other elders over the church of Ephesus. He says, oh, you have a job before you. Wolves will come, Satan will strike. You must give yourselves and your life in defense and protection and strengthening of this church. Because what is in this church is something that is inestimable and invaluable. This is what Paul says. Pastors, pay careful, careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God which he obtained with his own blood. The blood of God was shed to obtain the church. It's funny that in this, in this verse, even in the original Greek, Paul doesn't actually say Jesus. He doesn't use a human word. Like, like, like we want to jump and say, well, God doesn't have blood. Only the incarnate God has blood. And yet, what theologians call the communication of attributes means that because Jesus is truly God and truly man, even though it's true God doesn't have blood, sometimes we can speak in such a way that God had blood. 
Just like we would never say that God had a mother, and yet the ancient creeds, and I think the scripture, gives us warrant to say that Mary was, touching humanity, she was the mother of God, because Jesus was God. It's not as if God had a, had a mother, it's not as if Mary needs to be worshipped. Nonsense. But also it is the case that God does not have blood because God is incorporeal and immaterial. He is spirit. He's an infinite, immaterial, unbound spirit. So he can't have blood. He has no cells for oxygen to be delivered to and he doesn't need oxygen even if he was. He's God. He doesn't have blood. And yet Paul says the church was purchased by God's blood. It was obtained, possessed. The language really is bought with his blood. Why would Paul not interject and maybe theologically more uh, 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 acceptable language in this verse? Because he's trying to make the point. Pastors, elders of the Ephesian church, what the church was purchased with was not merely Joshua, son of Joseph in Nazareth. It was not merely his, the carpenter turned rabbi. It was not merely his blood. It was the life of the God-man. It was the blood of God that obtained the church. That is, that the whole of the church was purchased by God's blood because each individual was purchased by God's blood. It's not, as some theologians, or maybe some, maybe just wrong thinking of the way you think about the church, that that God has you because you were tucked away in the back of the corner when he purchased the whole. You ever feel like that? Jesus obviously loved and gave himself for some of those other Christians, maybe the great mighty martyrs or missionaries from history, me, I was, he didn't realize that I was, I was a stowaway. I was sort of stuck underneath the shelf when he purchased the whole thing, and now, now, I'm, now I'm in. Right? Have you ever watched, watched a storage auctions? It's a show or, or just a, 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 maybe, a, maybe a good way to make a hustle. All right? Stay at home, mums. Here's what you can do. You go to these storage places, these sheds, these five by five meter you know, storage uh, uh, compartments that, that these companies rent out. And if tenants have failed to pay their monthly invoice, then they have a certain amount of weeks before that whole uh, 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 shed sort of gets possessed by the storage company. The owners no longer get to call it their material and, and the, uh, the storage... Uh, people get to just auction it off, and, and here's how they do it. They get all of these, uh, uh, I guess, uh, people, let's call them that, who want to, some would say trailer trash, I wouldn't say that, that's mean, uh, uh, some, you know, these hard squeezers, for some reason they want to come and blind bid on these storage containers, and they stand outside and, and they bid, oh, this is a three by three, uh, uh, it belonged to this sort of couple, that's all you know, and the shed is closed, and you have to just Take a guess, take a gamble, and throw in your lot to try and win what's in there. Now, sometimes you can hardly open the shed because there is so much garbage. It's as if they just had a dump truck worthy of all of their house, and it just shoved in there. They just got it closed, and they didn't pay a single invoice and left. It was cheaper than going to the tip, they thought. Uh, Some other times, they open it up, and inside is, is a handcrafted mahogany canoe finished with all of the brass finishings, inlay, pearl uh, uh, names, and and here it's yours. You pay 50 bucks for the shed, and there it is. Now, here's what some of us feel like with Jesus. Jesus sort of looked at this thing called church. His dad was the uh, uh, guy next to him. He said, you should buy this one. And so Jesus purchased the church at the price of his blood. And let me show you, it was affectionate, it was loving. But when he opened it, some of you guys were just, you happened to be in there. And so you belong to Jesus, there's no doubt you're his and you're possessed and, you know, he'll take you to heaven. But had he seen, you know what I mean? Like had he, had he been able to see what heaven would look like, what your life would look like before he died for you, it might not have bid on that storage box. Anybody else feel like that sometimes? Uh, Jesus' purchasing of the church It is not that he owns the whole church because he bought us at a lump sum, tried to get a sale, and you happen to be in there. We are much more like a privately, personally curated treasure room in an elderly mansion. That as you walk in, the owner could walk you through and tell you precisely the penny that was paid for every rare and ancient book, for every tiny little china doll, for every little Russian uh, uh, model that he's got, for every uh, uh, war plane uh, recreation that he's got, for every uh, portrait of a Puritan that hangs in its original frame. He could tell you how much he paid, where he was, what he sold in order to get it. This is a privately curated room of treasures. That, that is what the church is like for Jesus. 
He's not simply lump purchased in a storage auction. He came to the earth and with intentional, this is where the divine mind of Jesus Christ comes in. Somehow he intricately, intimately, consciously knew of every sin that you had committed which he was dying for. He saw not just a conglomerate body called the church in his eyes as he hung there on the cross. He saw your face. So intimate and personal is the union with which Christ entered into as our representative. That he, that he was conscious of whose sins he was bearing. Of what sins you had committed and what he was being counted guilty for. Jesus is not a human version of the dumb goats from the Old Testament. The poor things just sitting there. No clue why the nice man dressed in white has his hand upon its head. And then the sword comes across its throat. Is that, did you realize that theologically or at least covenantally in the ceremonial system what it was doing was receiving by imputation all of the sins ever committed by all of the Israelites that year? Yeah, we know that because we read the Bible. Did it have any clue? No, it's, it's just here for show. The poor little goat has no clue what's going on. Jesus was no dumb goat. He was not standing with the Father's spiritual hand upon his head with all of the sins being imputed to him, with no clue what he was paying for. Jesus was a true, conscious representative of each one of us on that cross. And he has purchased each one of us by his precious blood. Each one's sins paid for in full. Your sins known by him, purchased in full. And you sit as a treasured, little, polished, kept, wonderful prize upon his shelf in the, in the cupboard of his own heart in heaven. Therefore, you should take comfort. You have been obtained by the blood of God. God obtained you by his own blood. The Heidelberg Catechism, some of you are familiar with it. It's, it's a question and answer form of learning theology and memorizing spiritual and Christian truths and memorizing texts of scripture and it starts out, this catechism, this question and answer devotional form, it starts out with, with a beautiful question. It doesn't sound all that theological. It's deeply devotional and spiritual, though. It's opening question. Some of you could even answer it in your head. What is your only comfort in life and death? Some of you know the short version. My only comfort in life and death is that I belong with both body and soul, both in life and death, to my Savior, Jesus Christ. I've got the long version here. My only comfort is that I am not my own, but belong with body and soul, both in life and death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood, and he has set me free from all the power of the devil. He also preserves me in such a way that without the will of my heavenly Father, not a hair can fall from my head. Indeed, all things must work together for my salvation. Therefore, by his Holy Spirit, he also assures me of eternal life and makes me heartily willing and ready from now on to live for him. This is my comfort in life and in death. I don't belong to me. I belong to him. I have been obtained by his own precious blood. What a wonderful, wonderful paragraph. So where can you go in all of your life that paid for is not stamped upon your soul. What could befall you? What could come against you? What could happen to you in all of your life where the fact that God has obtained me by his blood changes? Nothing. Nothing could befall you. Nothing could happen. You were purchased. Therefore, every happenstance which comes to you is known by God. There is not a, there's not a speck of dust. There would not be a sticky, grimy finger of any grandchild or great-grandchild that could come into that privately, personally curated art museum of an old man. It is behind glass. There is not a single finger of a grandchild that could touch any one of those things without the say-so of the one who purchased those items. There is not an attack of the devil. There is not a slander of the devil. There is not a rumor spread about you. There is not a loved one that passes away. There is not a sickness that comes into your body. There is not an end of employment. There is not a dollar short on your income. There is nothing that ever happens. There is nothing that ever happens to you. You are purchased by the blood of Jesus. You're obtained with his own blood. What sins could ever come upon your conscience? where God's voice does not drown it out. 
I obtained them. You are purchased. Therefore, take comfort. But we could also say this, that where we consider and where we remember the holy, precious blood that was shed for us, we remember that Paul does it, Peter does it, I believe Jesus does it elsewhere also, that he's emphasizing the, the power, the, the, the preciousness here. He's emphasizing the value here more than any gold or silver. He's emphasizing the, 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 the preciousness of the purchasing thing that is the blood of God in Acts 20 verse 28. He's emphasizing that so that those purchased, or those who are shepherding those purchased, so that the people who are purchased can recall what a great obligation they have to their God who purchased such a price for them. That is the context of emphasizing the purchase for you was not, my friend, <coughs> it was not to tell you how worthy you are. I've heard, I've heard preachers say this. Oh, you don't, you don't pay, you don't, Jesus wouldn't have died like that for horses, would he? Oh, this is a great point. Here, here it comes. He goes, you know, look, you want to know how much you're worth? Look at how much was paid for you. You know how much you deserved? Look at what God gave in order to get you. And in this uh, idiotic and even blasphemous way, it, it hinges, it, it uses rather, the whole value of Jesus in the cross as a self-esteem leverage to say, well, Jesus wouldn't die for me if I wasn't at least equal to his worth, would he? Look at how much God loved me. Look at how lovable I was. Look at how worthy I was. He gave that price. I must be worth that price. If I was such a damned sinner like, the, like these uh, darned preachers keep on saying, then surely the price paid would have been so, so low because I was so, so, so valueless, right? Doesn't, doesn't that logic play over? Well, yes, if you think of yourself as this morally neutral object that Jesus just wants in a, I don't know, a shelf in heaven. The purchasing, again, was not a ransom to Satan. The, the buying, again, the shedding of his blood was not to purchase merely an object. As we said before, it was to pay for the justice owed. <laughs> and now we look at the price paid. The invaluable, inestimable, infinite value of Christ's blood. And we realize that in some measure, while a comfort is also an insult. Oh, that's how much I owed. Dad, where did the house go? Where did the holiday home go? Why did you sell your sports car? Why are you going around in rags? Where's mum's engagement ring? And he said, I found your tax receipt. That's what. I paid off your debts. I found what you owed to your, to your, 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 your criminal friends. That's what happened. I found what you owed. Oh, you would say. Oh, I was in some bad debt. When we look at the blood of Jesus Christ, we should be pierced. Uh, uh, Sharnock, one of the uh, Puritans, said that as we look to the pierced one, so our hearts should be pierced with the recognition of how much our sin cost to be done away with. It is not a self-worshipping, self-propping exercise to look at Jesus' death and say, look, look, just look at how wonderful you are. Look at how much you were valued. Look at, how, look at how much you were going for on the market value in the market of the spiritual realm. No, look at how much your sin cost. Look at how much price had to be paid in order for you to be redeemed. Look at how great your debt to God. But as we do this, we must understand that Jesus' blood, as we consider Jesus' blood being paid for us, in the spirit of 1 Peter, Jesus' blood has the power for those who have faith. I pray that's you and I. Jesus' blood, considering the shedding of blood from his hands, his sides, his back, his face, his sweat glands in the garden, Jesus' sufferings and his blood and his dying has the power for those with faith to turn sin disgusting and foul in the mouth. It has the effect to motivate your repentance and make sin taste disgusting to your soul. Here's what Isaac Ambrose, another Puritan, said. Oh, the curse and bitterness that our sins have brought on Jesus Christ. When I but think of these bleeding veins, bruised shoulders, scourged sides, furrowed back, harrowed temples, hold hands and feet, that is dug, nail-pierced hands and feet, 
and then consider that my sins were the cause of all, methinks I should need no more argument for self-abhorrence. Christians, would not your hearts rise against him that should kill your father? Would not your soul rise in defense against those who would harm your mother, kill your brother, your wife, your husband, your dearest relations in all the world? Oh, then how should your hearts and souls rise against sin? Surely your sin it was that murdered Christ and killed him. Who is, instead of all relations, who is a thousand, thousand times dearer to you than father, mother, husband, child, or whomsoever? One thought of this should, I think, be enough to make you say as Job did, I abhor myself and I repent in dust and ashes. Oh, what is that cross on the back of Christ? My sins. Oh, what is that crown on the head of Christ made of thorns? My sins. Oh, what is the nail in the right hand and that in the left hand of Christ? My sins they are. Oh, what is that spear in the side of Christ? It is my sins. What are those nails and wounds in the feet of Jesus? They are my sins. Oh, my sins. My sins. My sins. To consider the blood of Jesus Christ rightly leads us to a proper consideration of the abhorrence, the disgust, the sinfulness of our sins. There's no, there's no little sin for the Christian. Let pagans, let unbelievers muck around with thoughts of little sin. We are those purchased by the blood of Jesus. Every sin must be avoided and if committed, repented of and confessed as such a murderous sin that pinned Jesus to the cross. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 19 to 20 therefore tells us, you are not your own. You were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. The specific context of 1 Corinthians 6 is that Paul is saying those who are using some kind of excuse, whatever it may be, theological or, or merely personal or personal, whatever it is, Christians who make an excuse that what I do in my body, in the sexual sphere, does not get in the way of my salvation because my salvation is spiritual and my sex is physical. It's a lie on two accounts. Sex is spiritual and your salvation is physical because Jesus bought your body. Jesus bought this body now. He purchased an upgrade for that body called the resurrection, but this body right now belongs to him. It's owned by him. You're not your own. You were bought with a price. You're not your own Lord. You don't make your own decisions. Everywhere you go, you belong to him. Wherever you are, whatever you are tempted to do, this ruling thought must come into your mind. The precious blood of Jesus purchased me. I'm not allowed to do what I want. Not with my schedule, not with my body, not with my money, not with my speech. It, it, it should be the case. I hope it is for each of you. That if you're at work and your bestie texts you, hey, pub for lunch, you should respond. Goodness, I hope you respond. I can't. I'm at work. What you're saying when you say that is literally this. I can't. My hours between 9 and 5 have been purchased in a contract to my employer. I don't belong to myself between 9 and 5. That's what pay is. I'm, I've sold my hours to somebody else so that I can do work for them in return for a cash amount. That's employment. Sounds like slavery? A little bit. That's okay. You are in those moments when you say, I can't, I'm at work. What about dream world? I can't, I'm at work. There's a great movie on. Don't your unemployed friends just annoy you with this or your uni mates when they're on holidays? <laughs> no, I can't, I'm at work. Have you heard about it? Get a job. Uh, I can't, I'm at work. This is the mindset for the Christian. Every day, every moment, not for eight hours, but for 24 hours out of every day and infinitely more. We must say to sin, to Satan, to the world, to our flesh, we must say, I'm owned. These hours that I currently exist in have been purchased by Jesus. This body that I'm currently in has been purchased by Jesus. Even if, let's just be honest, even if you want to do it. This is great. So that you don't just uh, stand away from temptation because you want to. There is an obligation here. Paul knows, Peter knows, Jesus knows, my friends, the Holy Spirit knows that sometimes our desires and our affections are not strong enough to keep us away from sin. And you try and tell yourself, I should not want this which pierced my Savior. 
but you do. And you want it still. So at least in that moment, tell yourself this, I'm not allowed. Oh, I want it, and that's treacherous enough. But at least remind yourself, I'm not allowed. I was bought with a price. I must glorify God in my body. There are some Christians who have no right to the name because their life looks like no change of ownership ever occurred. Before Jesus, I did what I wanted. I slept with who I wanted. I spent how I wanted. Then I met Jesus, and he's so good. Now I can sleep with who I want. Now I can do what I want, and I can spend on what I want. If ownership of your life did not change, then your eternal destination did not change. If you are purchased, if you are ransomed, your life must look like it is conforming to Jesus Christ. Conduct, Peter says, conduct yourselves with fear. Do not count it lightly that you have been purchased by the king's greatest, deepest, most wonderful treasury in all of not just creation, but in all of even God himself. That prized being that held the love of the Father greater than anybody else was the Son, and he gave him to be crucified and pierced in our place so as to provide the blood for our purchase. Now we must live so as to glorify God in our body, so as to be holy as he is holy in all of our conduct, knowing that we were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from our forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Friends, this is our injunction. This price has been paid for you. Live like it. Take comfort in this price shed for you. Repent, considering this price has been shed for your sins. You have been saved from this wrath and conduct yourselves with fear in the time of your exile. And what of the lost here tonight? What about you who hear all of this and you're untouched, unmoved? You've not before now really considered where you're going before you die? Maybe you have many times and you still sort of hold Jesus at arm's length. Now maybe consider the offense that you are dealing up to the God of all gods and the Lord of all lords. That in emptying heaven's treasury in order to give for the salvation of sinners in the greatest expense and transaction that has ever occurred, the Father giving forth his Son in love for you. Love gushing from the wounds of Jesus for people just like you. And yet will you stand off Consider it nothing, walk away, and go back to enjoy that which killed God's Son. Surely you can agree, eternal wrath, and only eternal wrath forever, is deserved upon such people like yourself. But if you turn, and if you flee, and if you receive, and if you call on God, say, please purchase me. Please, that blood that was shed, make it effectual for me. If you plead the blood, if you run to the printed receipt that says paid in full for any sinners herewith and you take up the pen of faith and you write down your name in that moment, entered into Christ, joined to his account, all of your sins will be paid for. Don't make up any excuses. Don't think about maybe tomorrow. You may not have tomorrow. Believe now. He stands ready to receive you. Let's pray. Worthy are you, O Lamb, right now to receive the whole world of souls in glorious gift to you. You are worthy to receive the praise of every tongue and every breath and every creature in heaven and on earth and beneath the earth right now. But we know that sin, the presence of that curse and that treacherous disobedience means that many refuse to give you such glory. O oh, Lamb, you will be glorified in the destruction of them. But we pray that they not be in our midst tonight. Please, with those who are still far off, who are still unwashed by your blood, who are still slaves and need to be ransomed, Lord God, would you please bring them near? Give them grace. Make them your children and save them. Would you please, Lord God, lead their hearts to sing in accord with that heavenly song, to say, worthy is this Jesus that I have never before worshipped, but worthy is him. Because he is glorious, I have now learned. He died for the likes of me, I have now learned. And I am purchased by his blood. What grace and what mercy. Would you lead those lost to sing those words in their heart and place their faith in Jesus Christ.
Us, Lord God, who know you, who have been purchased, who find ourselves liberated from sin's grasp and, and sealed, ransomed, totally purchased, permanently purchased by the love of the Father in the blood of the Son, may you make us to despise our sin as we ought. We will never think of sin properly, purely enough as you yourself do, but we ask that you would give us that painful, that, that painful growth to realize as our hearts expand in, in exaltation for the glorious Savior that we would also be repulsed by the presence of sin still in our life. And, oh, Lord God, that we would make no room for it. We would not tolerate it to live in our midst. And would you, by your Son's precious blood, forgive us when we have. Oh, God, would you make us holy for your own name's sake. Would you glorify Jesus in this moment by bringing more souls to him to worship that they may sing a new song. We love you, Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for shedding your blood. Everybody said.